Today's program is intended to give you a sense of how the legal system treats design professionals when there is a bodily injury claim on uh, any kind of a bodily injury situation on a construction site or adjacent to a construction site where the injury is to a member of the public who happens to be in the area of the construction or when the injury is to a user of the built environment once the project is complete. The title really shows the exposure you have. It could be to a meritless claim that saps your time, your internal resources, including your insurance deductible obligation, and impairs your aggregate professional liability insurance coverage. But it could be a claim based on your design negligence or your assumption of an exposure during construction and could be so egregious that your professional reputation is harmed significantly. Here are the issues we will address. I want to give you a short history of how design firms have protected themselves in the past and changes in the law or in its interpretation that have caused problems in the exposure of design firms to bodily injury claims. Recent claim statistics show that bodily injury claims, those with physical harm to construction workers and non-workers around the construction site and project users, have all increased greatly in frequency and dramatically in severity in recent years. Claims happen. In any year, an average of about one quarter of all design firms insured by the CNA Professional Liability Insurance Program experience a claim alleging harm from their negligent performance of professional services. While only a third of these claims end up with an insurance payment to rectify harm or to pay for a cost, a loss, or a damage, all claims take a design firm's time, affect the firm's profitability, and impairs the firm's reputation. For decades, worker and non-worker bodily injury claims were a small part of the entire range of claims against design firms. Most were defensible, and few ever made it to the um, adjudication before a jury. Uh, that seems to be changing. While part of the increase in claims and settlements or jury awards seem to be due to social inflation or the public's concern that any harm should be remedied at a much greater financial level, there is also a change in how design firms' contracts protect or do not protect them and in the procedures and documentations for on-site activities that, in that could increase the design firm's exposure. There are basically three types of bodily injury claims that occur involving design. The first is the injured worker claims. These are usually attempts to reach out for recovery in addition to the workers' comp settlement. In most states, design firms are not put under a workers' comp umbrella such that the contractors or subcontractors' workers' comp coverage would also protect the design firm from any related claim. Because almost universally, the payments under our workers' comp plans are inadequate to cover all injury expenses. Injured workers often use the, if you've got a phone, you've got a lawyer, injury law firms that work on a contingency basis. If they can find any possibility of a recovery, these plaintiff firms will bring an action over the workers' comp benefit. There is also an increase in claims from passers-by who are injured because of uh, construction site activities. In most cases, the design firms that are hit with these actions are engineering firms or construction management firms that have a greater site involvement. Where there is an egregious injury, a car that rams a bridge abutment, a bicyclist who was swallowed up by an uncovered excavated area, or a child who was exposed to harmful dust from a construction site, the litigation involves everyone. And because there is no way to prevent a jury trial, the defendants face what could be a very sympathetic jury that is guided by the idea that someone harmed should not simply get remedial expenses, but is entitled to significant compensation. And of course, there are the slip and fall claims, as well as some more dramatic claims brought by users of the facility alleging that they were harmed because of negligent design. First, I want to show you the three major sources of exposure. 
perhaps the worst is when you sign a contract that includes or implies that you are responsible for safety at the construction site beyond your normal legal liability to protect your staff. But there are licensing laws and ethical requirements that place some level of responsibility on you for injuries. You as a professional are supposed to, to as your paramount duty, protect health and safety. And that at times can extend your obligation on the construction site. And often firms basically volunteer to assist the contractor who, because the contractor has been given control of the site, is a party in charge of site safety. They do it by assuming a level of site safety responsibilities that usually exceeds both the contractual obligation that the firm bargained for and a general duty to protect public health and safety. Now, until the mid 1960s, liability usually was based on contractual obligations. Uh, in the standard contract, it was to supervise the work of the contractor and uh, gave the uh, design firm the right to stop work of the contractor. Addition of a standard disclaimer of means, methods, techniques, sequences, and procedures of the work of the contractor and for safety programs and precautions, which were part of the contractor's control of the site and its work, changed uh, the AIA uh, contracts and later EJCDC contracts starting in 1963. Vic Schinner, who started our insurance program, served as an insurance advisor to the AIA contract documents committee and produced claims information showing that courts were broadly interpreting the supervise and the right to stop work contractual obligations to include a much greater duty than design firms were capable of providing. So because of the original language, design firms were made an easy target for injured worker claims and for claims from others who might have been injured during the construction process. They also ended up with more claims from contractors who said that the design firms did not apply appropriate supervision or stop the work in, in situations that weren't necessary. The added disclaimer language was instrumental in protecting design firms. And later I will show you what it is and why it is essential in any design contract that could lead to construction. After claims for worker injuries decreased, they shot up again in the early 1980s because of a misguided effort to increase OSHA protection of workers. During the Reagan administration, the Secretary of Labor was Ray Donovan, who was a large campaign uh, donor and who ran a large construction company in New Jersey. And he hated how OSHA treated construction contracts. So he required OSHA to deflect enforcement against construction contractors and focus on design firms, especially those who had any performance of on-site evaluation of the work. Uh, I know this because I was a lobbyist for the AIA at the time and was called into the OSHA top staff person's office and told exactly that. So OSHA fines against design firms increase and gave evidence that design firms could be held responsible for site injuries. This increased direct claims from injured workers. It took an OSHA case against CH2M Hill to rein in the OSHA focus on design firms. Uh, one of the most critical issues in industry is whether architects and engineers should be held responsible for construction safety on job sites. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration says yes, but only under certain conditions. Uh, in the case against CH2M Hill, the occupation the Safety and Health Review Commission overturned the one application of that view on appeal in a case that involved a, a Denver-based unit of CH and its role as a program manager for the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District on a $2.2 billion water pollution abatement program. On May 5th, 1989, OSHA cited CH2M Health Central Inc for 46 willful safety violations in connection with a 1988 methane tunnel explosion that killed three supervisors of the construction contract. Uh, the contractor also was charged with 68 violations. It encountered methane while boring a two mile crosstown tunnel and evacuated the site 
that did not follow the evacuation plan. It failed to shut down all the non-essential equipment and the supervisors returned after waiting only 17 minutes instead of the one hour minimum. The H2M Hills citation and proposed $460,000 fine for violating OSHA construction standards were for having 45 pieces of unimproved electrical equipment in the tunnel and improper ventilation. Uh, CH2M Hill claimed that the standard did not apply to it because a firm did not engage in construction work, did not exercise substantial supervision over the construction work performed by the contractor, and did not create or control the hazardous condition. The OSHA Review Commission agreed with it. So after that ruling, design firms again saw a drop in direct worker compensation claims along with a drop in OSHA citations. And here is how and why the contract language uh, in standard contracts uh, makes sense uh, and why OSHA penalties and court rulings can put design firms in danger. A workers' comp system is supposed to eliminate litigation by having a statutory settlement of injured worker claims. But low awards and aggressive plaintiff attorneys can find a way around the protection. And when they find a sympathetic jury, can end up really raiding the deep pockets mentioned in this slide. I mentioned a design professional's licensing law duty and ethical obligation. But even though a responsibility is created, it is not unreasonable. Here's how most, most courts interpret that duty. It has to be that a risk of injury was foreseeable, meaning it was predictable, uh, that the design professional must have had some element of control based on its relationship with the contractor, uh, that the design professional actually observed and recognized a dangerous situation or condition, so they have actual knowledge of the danger, and that the design professional had a reasonable opportunity to prevent the injury and did not take advantage of that opportunity. So what does a design firm do to protect itself from assuming responsibility beyond its ethical duty? Here's the guidance that we have been providing for half a century, and it is good today as it was decades ago. You address an unsafe condition that you see or recognize by a written report telling the project superintendent of what you saw and what you recognize. It doesn't say that it was unsafe, it says in your opinion it was unsafe. You use a standard procedure to record the dates, the conditions, uh, the name of the person who you uh, uh, notified, um, and uh, you know that really helps to prevent you from assuming a duty, a continuing duty for site safety. It's this one instance that you reported. Uh, the documentation also should be sent to the project owner indicating that an unsafe condition was spotted and that's a breach of the contract for construction that puts the burden on the contractor to keep the site safe. If an unsafe condition ends up with a worker injury, it stops the project, it harms the owner. So when you're out there as the eyes and ears of the project owner, you have to report what you see as an unsafe condition. Now, I will show you some examples of how construction sites often treat workers as somewhat expendable and focus on speed and reduce costs in a way that often puts workers at risk. But if you see and recognize a danger, simply documenting it might not be what the law requires you to do. So here are some steps, right? If it's not a clear and present danger, you report it to the person who can remedy the situation. Right? If the danger is more critical, or recurring to threaten the safety of adjacent areas as passes by, or indicates an inability of the contractor to meet contractual requirements. Um, you know, good sense suggests that you make sure the owner knows about it. The owner still has the power to stop the work, and perhaps to OSHA or government officials, uh, because they will then come out on the site and give their expert opinion and uh, cite any problems that they see. If the danger is imminent, however, prudence and professionalism 
require immediate action. We'll talk a little bit about that. So what does the court look at if there's an injury and someone comes uh, with an action against the design professional? Um, the court will consider if there's a contractual responsibility for safety, uh, the right or the power of the design firm to control site safety conditions, and the opportunity or capacity to mitigate the risk or avert the harm. So the court looks at both the obligations established by contract and the ability of the design professional to identify and prevent bodily injury under certain circumstances. So, um, you know, courts have routinely protected design firms when they act in a reasonable and professional manner. If they find that there are duties assumed by contract, then the firms have to carry them out. You know, courts have found that in regard to safety, if design professional acts in a reasonable manner, depending on the circumstances of the dangerous situation, that the design professional observes and recognizes, the design professional and the design professional's firm would have performed in a non-negligent manner and would not be held responsible for the worker injury or the injury of a passerby. Although the reasonableness of a design professional's action varies from case to case, reporting a known dangerous situation to the party in the best position to remedy it is usually held to be rational. Now, here are three examples of, of uh, claims that could happen. Uh, let's talk about trench collapses. OSHA requires that employers protect workers from cave-ins by sloping and benching or benching the sides of excavations or supporting the sides of excavations with shoring or placing a shield between the site of the excavations and the work area. In many instances, contractors have shoring shields on the job site but fail to use them because it takes longer. Last year, OSHA reported 39 workers' deaths as a result of trench collapse. And one of the most egregious was in Texas, where two workers were leveling a sewer pipe in a 23 foot deep and only 34 inch wide trench that had vertical walls and no uh, protection system. And that the workers nearest means of egress was over 130 feet away from where they were working. It had rained the afternoon before and water had accumulated in the bottom of the excavation which weakened the trench. Now, both of these workers were killed. Uh, that's separate from the OSHA fine. It was for $250,000 plus. But think about what, if you were on that site and saw that, you probably would have recognized the danger. And that means you would have a duty to your client and to those endangered workers to do something reasonable about it. In that case, telling them to get out of that trench. Okay? Now there's other things, think about a crane. Another example of assumed responsibilities of a construction site is a situation we had where a resident project representative was there during a crane installation of equipment on the project roof. Because there was faulty communication between a contractor and a crane operator, the design firm's resident project representative stepped in to relay signals. The crane operator hit a power line that was supposed to be unpowered, but wasn't. And the design firm paid out its limits of insurance to the survivors of the crane operator who was electrocuted. And that was because the resident project representative assumed the duty of communicating to the uh, crane operator. Uh, another recent situation is a traffic control, uh, uh, an on-site action. So we had a claim from a highway, uh, highway remediation project. The plaintiff who was operating an excavator on the project was struck by a tree that was cut on the hillside above the roadway. A log unexpectedly slid down the hillside, striking the plaintiff and pinning him against the high, highway guardrail. As a result, the plaintiff suffered severe injuries multiple fractures of traumatic brain injury. Our insured was hired by the government road agency to provide engineering services for improvements to the highway. During the course of the project, the agency added tree cutting to the project as a result of storm damage. Uh, two other parties, in fact, 
who were injured, including a government employee who lost part of her foot and a contractor employee who lost a leg. The tree work was made part of the overall project and therefore the plaintiffs argue that the insurance construction manager role extended to the tree filling. The contract between the government agency and the insured had multiple provisions that addressed the construction manager's duty to maintain safety. While the contractor responsible for the tree cutting was also held responsible, our insured also faced liability given its safety responsibilities. And in design negligence, there's an, another example from uh, Texas. Our policyholder designed a Texas subdivision and the design include signage and a wall around the subdivision. A 15 year old who was on a bicycle on a sidewalk was struck by a truck. Both the plaintiff, the, the 15 year old and the driver both alleged that signage and the wall prevented clear visibility relate, uh, resulting in the accident. It was tragic in that the train, Team was struck and dragged, uh, had significant injuries, uh, long hospitalization, traumatic brain injuries, and lasting injuries, including lost vision in his right eye. Uh, he also required multiple surgeries from, for, for his fractures. The facts were that the driver came to a stop at the intersection, but as a teenager approached the intersection, the teenager proceeded to cross. The driver stated that he pulled up to the stop sign and looked both ways while waiting for an opening traffic so he could turn right. He alleged that his view down the sidewalk was blocked by the wall and the sign for the development. As the traffic was cleared to his left, he accelerated into the right-hand turn and after striking a plaintiff, he proceeded to drive his truck over him, dragging a boy and a bike and pinning them underneath him. So in that case, the design negligence was placing the wall too close to the corner having signage that would block a view and made uh, turning hazardous. Another example is uh, an ice slide. We had a situation where a design firm was held liable for a user injury um, when a firm had designed a performing arts center with interesting roof profiles. But after the first large snowfall, a patron walking into the facility was injured and later died because a large accumulation of snow and ice trapped in the roof design, let loose and slid down over the entry area, crushing the woman while walking in. The negligence was that the design firm should have known about snow loading and should have designed an entry area where falling snow and ice would not endanger the pedestrian. So there's examples of on-site activities when you have extensive project control, especially as a construction manager, or when you sign a contract that puts you in control of safety and for negligence in your design. Now, I mentioned that um, disclaimer language is added to the AIA contract over 60 years ago. Uh, and it should be in every contract where design leads to construction. It helps avoid the workers' claims, but it also has been helpful in other bodily injury claims. Here is the section of the AIA B101 in 2017. The red is the part that was added over 60 years ago. And it has been upheld in court many, many times because it uh, shows that the architect did not have responsibility for construction means, methods, techniques, sequences, and procedures, which could lead to injuries, or for the safety precautions and programs because the contractor is in charge of the site. Uh, the AI uh, document also has a way to prevent a court from finding that reviewing shop drawings changes that duty. And here is what is basic in the shop drawing review process. The architect shall not uh, review, shall not constitute approval of safety precautions or construction means, methods, techniques, sequences, and procedures. Right? Again, that language should be in your contract. The standard engineer's contract has the same language to prevent the engineer from being construed as having site safety responsibility. This language is critical in preventing injured worker claims or claims from those around the construction site were injured. 
right? Again, it says the engineer does not supervise, direct control, or have any authority over the contractor's work, or means, methods, techniques, sequences, or procedures of construction, because again, the contractor selects what how the contractor is going to build the project, or for safety you know, precautions and programs. Um, it also goes on to talk about security or safety at the site and failure of the contractor to comply with the law. And um, the AJCDC language does recognize. Uh, the licensing law and ethical duty of the professional engineer with this language. This has never been construed to expand the duty of the engineer for site safety beyond what the courts expect as reasonable responses uh, to a known dangerous situation. Now, I'm going to give you a, a few examples of language we've seen in contract and point out um, whether or not they enlarge your risk of bodily injury. Um, first, this one. First paragraph says basically you're the owner's representative during the construction phase services. Usually you are an agent of the owner during construction because you're having the having a look at the contract between the owner and the construction contractor. You're helping to act on behalf of the owner uh, to a certain extent, and that's provided by the agreement. This, however, adds another um, provision, and it states that as agent of the owner, uh, you shall evaluate the safety precautions and programs required of the contractor by the contract documents. Now, if you have the skill, and if you're getting paid for doing that, you might do that. If you really understand what safety precautions and programs are required by OSHA and by the contract documents, you could do that. But in most cases, you don't know that. You don't have that skill set. And you're not getting paid to do that. That's why it's left to the contractor in the contract documents. So language like this could get you into a lot of trouble. Now, we have seen this in contract. Right? But you shall ensure, okay, ensure that all personnel performing any construction based services on its behalf, behalf of the design firm, comply with the OSHA regs and general construction standards. All this says is what you're responsible for anyway. If you put someone on a construction site, the person has to have the proper hard hat, the proper shoes other protective equipment, whether it's you know, breathing or uh, eyesight protection, uh, you can't send a person out onto a construction site uh, unprotected, right? You owe that to your employees. And if the contractor has a set of rules for access to the construction site, you have to meet those requirements as well. So you have this responsibility to your own employee. Um, and uh, that is something you cannot disclaim. That is something you have as an employer and that OSHA will hold you to. And um, uh, if you look at the very end of this, uh, it modifies that construction means, methods, techniques, sequences, or procedures, and safety precautions and programs. But all it does is say, if you observe and you recognize violation of OSHA standards or safety precautions required by the contract documents, you have to report it to the owner. And again, remember, the owner is a party that will lose if that site is shut down, right? The, the owner is investing a lot in a capital asset. Once that construction to proceed as quickly and safely as possible, so if you have the obligation to report anything you observe as a violation, that's what you would be doing anyway. Okay. Um, and let's, uh, um, okay, let's look at this one. And this would expand the duty of the design firm beyond what the design firm is capable of, right? Um, yes, you have to take 
necessary and desirable precautions for public health and safety as a licensed design professional. But that does not extend to what is here in the orange type, right? Uh, this would put you in res uh, both responsible and liable for just about any injury or loss on a project, not only injury to people, but damage on a project and losses on the project. Um, so if you see something as broad as this, uh, you have to get it out of your contract or you're going to be assuming responsibility that you have no control over and that you're not getting paid for. Now, a final reminder, be concerned if you're designing a project leading to construction. Uh, injury chains are increasing in frequency and severity and do not sign a contract or assume a contractor's duty in a way that makes you incur, right? So you don't accept contractual language that states or even implies that you have safety obligations for anyone other than your employees. Do not, by your action, assume responsibility for safety. And courts have held that um, if you react to an unsafe situation in a reasonable manner, you are not assuming responsibility for safety on the site. Right? That one instance is not an assumption of responsibility going forward. So you report any observed and recognized safety inadequacies to the contractor and to your client as part of your duty to the client. And if you recognize an immediate danger of the workers, such as in that trench, and you have something to have the ability to do something about it, like point them to get out of the trench, carry out your professional duty, and then you follow up with notices to the contractor. Thank you.